Section 7 of The Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3, translated by Jonathan Scott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3, translated by Jonathan Scott, 1754 to 1829. Section 7. The History of Prince Zain al-Asnam and the Sultan of the Genie. Part 2. They soon came to a vast lake. Mubarak sat down on the brink of it, saying to the prince, We must cross this sea. How can we, answered Zain, when we have no boat? You will see one appear in a moment, replied Mubarak. The enchanted boat of the Sultan of the Genie will come for us. But do not forget what I am going to say to you. You must observe a profound silence. Do not speak to the boatman, though his figure seems strange to you. Whatever extraordinary circumstance you observe, say nothing. For I tell you beforehand that if you utter one word when we are embarked, the boat will sink. I shall take care to hold my peace said the prince. You need only tell me what I am to do, and I will strictly comply. Whilst they were talking, he spied on a sudden a boat in the lake, made of red sandalwood. It had a mast of fine amber, and a blue satin flag. There was only one boatman in it, whose head was like an elephant's, and his body like that of a tiger. When the boat was come up to the prince and Mubarak, the monstrous boatman took them up one after another with his trunk, put them into his boat, and carried them over the lake in a moment. He then again took them up with his trunk, set them ashore, and immediately vanished with his boat. Now we may talk, said Mubarak. The island we are in belongs to the sultan of the genie. Look round you, prince. Can there be a more delightful spot? It is certainly a lively representation of the charming place God has appointed for the faithful observers of our law. Behold the fields adorned with all sorts of flowers and odoriferous plants. Admire those beautiful trees whose delicious fruit makes the branches bend down to the ground. Enjoy the pleasure of those harmonious songs formed in the air by a thousand birds of as many various sorts unknown in other countries. Zayn could not sufficiently admire the beauties with which he was surrounded, and still found something new as he advanced farther into the island. At length they came before a palace built of emeralds, encompassed by a wide moat, on the banks whereof, at certain distances, were planted such tall trees that they shaded the whole palace. Before the gate, which was of massive gold, was a bridge, formed of one single shell of a fish, though it was at least six fathoms long, and three in breadth. At the head of the bridge stood a company of genii, of a prodigious height, who guarded the entrance into the castle with great clubs of china steel. "'Let us at present proceed no farther,' said Mubarak. "'These genii will destroy us, and in order to prevent their coming to us, we must perform a magical ceremony. He then drew out of a purse which he had under his garment four long slips of yellow taffeta. One he put about his middle, and laid the other on his back, giving the other two to the prince who did the like. Then Mubarak laid on the ground two large tablecloths, on the edges whereof he scattered some precious stones, musk and amber. Afterwards he sat down on one of the cloths, and Zayn on the other. And Mubarak said to the prince, I shall now, sir, conjure the sultan of the genie, who lives in the palace that is before us. May he come in a peaceable mood to us. I confess I am not without apprehension about the reception he may give us. If our coming into this island is displeasing to him, he will appear in the shape of a dreadful monster. But if he approves of your design, he will show himself in the shape of a handsome man. As soon as he appears before us, you must rise and salute him, without going off your cloth, 
for you would certainly perish should you stir from it. You must say to him, Sovereign Lord of the Genie, my father who was your servant has been taken away by the angel of death. I wish your majesty to protect me, as you always protected my father. If the sultan of the genie, said Mubarak, ask you what favour you desire of him, you must answer, I most humbly beg of you to give me the ninth statue. Mubarak, having thus instructed Prince Zain, began his conjuration. Immediately their eyes were dazzled by a long flash of lightning, which was followed by a clap of thunder. The whole island was covered with a thick darkness. A furious storm of wind blew. A dreadful cry was heard. The island felt a shock, and there was such an earthquake as that which Azrael is to cause on the Day of Judgment. Zayn was startled, and began to regard these concussions of the elements as a very ill omen, when Mobarek, who knew better than he what to judge, began to smile, and said, take courage my prince all goes well in short that very moment the sultan of the genie appeared in the shape of a very handsome man yet there was something of a sternness in his air as soon as sultan zayn had made him the compliment he had been taught by mubarak the sultan of the genie smiling answered my son i loved your father and every time he came to pay me his respects I presented him with a statue, which he carried away with him. I have no less kindness for you. I obliged your father, some days before he died, to write that which you read on the piece of white satin. I promised him to receive you under my protection, and to give you the ninth statue, which in beauty surpasses those you have already. I had begun to perform my promise to him, it was I whom you saw in a dream in the shape of an old man. I caused you to open the subterraneous place where the urns and the statues are deposited. I have a great share in all that has befallen you, or rather, am the occasion of all. I know the motive that brought you hither. You shall obtain what you desire. Though I had not promised your father to give it, I would willingly grant it to you. But... You must first swear to me, by all that is sacred, that you will return to this island, and that you will bring me a maid who is in her fifteenth year, has never loved nor desired to. She must also be perfectly beautiful, and you, so much a master of yourself, as not even to desire her as you are conducting her hither. Sultan Zayn took the rash oath demanded of him. But, my lord, said he, suppose i should be so fortunate as to meet with such a maid as you require how shall i know that i have found her i own answered the sultan of the genie smiling that you might be mistaken in her appearance that knowledge is above the sons of adam and therefore i do not mean to depend upon your judgment in that particular i will give you a looking-glass which will be more certain than your conjectures when you shall have seen a maiden fifteen years of age, perfectly beautiful, you need only look into the glass in which you shall see her figure. If she be chaste, the glass will remain clean and unsullied. But if, on the contrary, it sullies, that will be a certain sign that she has not always been prudent, or at least that she has desired to cease to be so. Do not forget the oath you have taken, Keep it like a man of honour. Otherwise, I will take away your life, notwithstanding the kindness I have for you. Zayn al-Asnan protested again that he would faithfully keep his word. The sultan of the genie then delivered to him a looking-glass, saying, My son, you may return when you please. There is the glass you are to use. Zayn and Mubarak took leave of the sultan of the genie, and went towards the lake. The boatman with the elephant's head brought the boat and ferried them over the lake as he had done before. They joined their servants and returned with them again to Cairo. The young sultan rested a few days at Mubarak's house and then said to him, Let us go to Baghdad to seek a maiden for the sovereign of the genie. Why, are we not at Grand Cairo? answered Mubarak. 
Shall we not there find beautiful maidens? You are in the right, answered the prince. But how shall we explore where they are? Do not trouble yourself about that, answered Mobarek. I know a very shrewd old woman whom I will entrust with the affair, and she will acquit herself well. Accordingly, the old woman found means to show the sultan a considerable number of beautiful maidens of fifteen years of age. But when he had viewed them, and came to consult his looking-glass, the fatal touchstone of their virtue, the glass always appeared sullied. All the maidens in the court and city, who were in their fifteenth year, underwent the trial one after another, but the glass never remained bright and clear. When they saw there were no chaste maidens to be found in Cairo, they went to Baghdad, where they hired a magnificent palace in one of the chief quarters of the city, and began to live splendidly. They kept open house, and after all people had eaten in the palace, the fragments were carried to the dervishes, who by that means had comfortable subsistence. There lived in that quarter a pedant, whose name was Bebeker Muezin, a vain, haughty, and envious person. He hated the rich, only because he was poor, his misery making him angry at his neighbour's prosperity. He heard talk of Zayn al-Asnam, and of the plenty his house afforded. This was enough for him to take an aversion to that prince, and it proceeded so far that one day after the evening prayer in the mosque, he said to the people, Brethren, I have been told there is come to live in our ward a stranger who every day gives away immense sums. How do we know but that this unknown person is some villain who has committed a robbery in his own country and comes hither to enjoy himself? Let us take care, brethren. If the caliph should be informed that such a man is in our ward, it is to be feared he will punish us for not acquainting him with it. I declare for my part, I wash my hands of the affair, and if anything should happen amiss, it shall not lie at my door. The multitude, who are easily led away, with one voice cried to Bebeker, It is your business. Do you acquaint the council with it? The muezzin went home well pleased, and drew up a memorial, resolving to present it to the caliph next day. But Mubarak, who had been at prayers, and heard all that was said by the muezzin, put five hundred pieces of gold into a handkerchief, made up with a parcel of several silks, and went to Bebeker's house. The muezzin asked him in a harsh tone what he wanted. "'Holy Father,' answered Mubarak, with an obliging air, and at the same time putting into his hand the gold and the silk, "'I am your neighbour and your servant.' I come from Prince Zayn, who lives in this ward. He has heard of your worth, and has ordered me to come and tell you that he desires to be acquainted with you, and in the meantime desires you to accept of this small present. Bubeker was transported with joy, and answered Mubarak thus, Be pleased, sir, to beg the prince's pardon for me. I am ashamed I have not yet been to see him, but I will atone for my fault and wait on him to-morrow. Accordingly, the next day after morning prayer, he said to the people, You must know from your own experience, brethren, that no man is without some enemies. Envy pursues those chiefly who are very rich. The stranger I spoke to you about yesterday in the evening is no bad man, as some ill-designing persons would have persuaded me. He is a young prince, endowed with every virtue, it behoves us to take care how we give any injurious report of him to the caliph. Bubeker, having thus wiped off the impression he had the day before given the people concerning Zayn, returned home, put on his best apparel, and went to visit the young prince, who gave him a courteous reception. After several compliments had passed on both sides, Bubeker said to the prince, "'Sir, do you design to stay long at Baghdad?' I shall stay, answered Zayn, till I can find a maid fifteen years of age, perfectly beautiful, and so chaste that she has not only never loved a man, but even never desired to do so. You seek after a great rarity, replied the muezzin, and I should be apt to fear your search would prove unsuccessful, did I not know where there is a maid of that character. 
Her father was formerly a vizier, but has left the court and lived a long time in a lone house, where he applies himself solely to the education of his daughter. If you please, I will ask her of him for you. I do not question, but he will be overjoyed to have a son-in-law of your quality. Not so fast, said the prince. I shall not marry the maid before I know whether I like her. As for her beauty, I can depend on you, but what assurance can you give me in relation to her virtue? What assurance do you require? said Bebeker. I must see her face, answered Zane. That is enough to determine my resolution. You are skilled, then, in physiognomy? replied the Moezin, smiling. Well, come along with me to her father's. I will desire him to let you see her one moment in his presence. The Moezin conducted the prince to the vizier's, who, as soon as he was acquainted with the prince's birth and design, called his daughter and made her take off her veil. Never had the young sultan of Bussara beheld such a perfect and striking beauty. He stood amazed, and since he could then try whether the maid was as chaste as fair, he pulled out his glass, which remained bright and unsullied. When he perceived he had at length found such a person as he desired, he entreated the vizier to grant her to him. Immediately the cause was sent for, the contract signed, and the marriage prayer said. After this ceremony, Zayn conducted the vizier to his house, where he treated him magnificently, and gave him considerable presents. Next day, he sent a prodigious quantity of jewels by Mubarak, who conducted the bride home, where the wedding was kept with all the pomp that became Zayn's quality. When all the company was dismissed, Mubarak said to his master, Let us be gone, sir. Let us not stay any longer at Baghdad, but return to Cairo. Remember the promise you made the Sultan of the Genie. Let us go, answered the prince. I must take care to perform it exactly. Yet I must confess, my dear Mubarak, that if I obey the Sultan of the Genie, it is not without reluctance. The damsel I have married is so charming that I am tempted to carry her to Bussorah and place her on the throne. Alas, sir, answered Mubarak, take heed how you give way to your inclination. Make yourself master of your passions, and whatever it costs you, be as good as your word to the Sultan of the Genie. Well then, Mubarak, said the prince, do you take care to conceal the lovely maid from me? Let her never appear in my sight. Perhaps I have already seen too much of her. Mubarak made all ready for their departure. They returned to Cairo, and thence set out for the island of the Sultan of the Genie. When they were arrived, the maid who had performed the journey in a horse litter, and whom the prince had never seen since his wedding day, said to Mubarak, Where are we? Shall we be soon in the dominions of the prince, my husband? Madam, answered Mubarak, it is time to undeceive you. Prince Zayn married you only in order to get you from your father. He did not engage his faith to make you sovereign of Bussara, but to deliver you to the Sultan of the Genie, who has asked of him a virgin of your character. At these words she began to weep bitterly, which moved the prince and Mubarak. Take pity on me, said she. I am a stranger. You will be accountable to God for your treachery towards me. Her tears and complaints were of no effect, for she was presented to the Sultan of the Genie, who, having gazed on her with attention, said to Zayn, Prince, I am satisfied with your behaviour. The virgin you have brought me is beautiful and chaste, and I am pleased with the restraint you have put upon yourself to be as good as your promise to me. Return to your dominions, and when you shall enter the subterraneous room where the eight statues are, you shall find the ninth, which I promised you. I will make my genie carry it thither. Zayn thanked the sultan, and returned to Cairo with Mubarak, but did not stay long in Egypt, for his impatience to see the ninth statue made him hasten his departure. However, he could not but often think regretfully of the young virgin he had married 
and blaming himself for having deceived her, he looked upon himself as the cause and instrument of her misfortune. Alas, said he to himself, I have taken her from a tender father to sacrifice her to a genie. Oh, incomparable beauty, you deserve a better fate. Sultan Zain, disturbed with these thoughts, at length reached Bussorah, where his subjects made extraordinary rejoicings for his return. He went directly to give an account of his journey to his mother, who was in a rapture to hear that he had obtained the ninth statue. Let us go, my son, said she, let us go and see it, for it is certainly in the subterraneous chamber, since the sultan of the genie told you you should find it there. The young sultan and his mother, being both impatient to see the wonderful statue, went down into the room of the statues. But how great was their surprise when, instead of a statue of diamonds, they beheld on the ninth pedestal a most beautiful virgin, whom the prince knew to be the same whom he had conducted into the island of the genie. Prince, said the young maid, you are surprised to see me here. You expected to have found something more precious than me, and I question not but that you now repent having taken so much trouble. You expected a better reward. Madam, answered Zane, heaven is my witness that I more than once had nearly broken my word with the sultan of the genie to keep you to myself. Whatever be the value of a diamond statue, is it worth the satisfaction of having you mine? I love you above all the diamonds and wealth in the world. Just as he had done speaking, a clap of thunder was heard, which shook the subterranean place. Zayn's mother was alarmed, but the sultan of the genie immediately appearing, dispelled her fear. Madam, said he to her, I protect and love your son. I had a mind to try whether at his age he could subdue his passions. I know the charms of this young lady have wrought on him, and that he did not punctually keep the promise he had made me not to desire her. But I am well acquainted with the frailty of human nature. This is the ninth statue I designed for him. It is more rare and precious than the others. Live, said he, directing his discourse to the young prince. Live happy, Zane, with this young lady who is your wife. And if you would have her true and constant to you, love her always, and love her only. Give her no rival, and I will answer for her fidelity. Having spoken these words, the sultan of the genie vanished, and Zayn, enchanted with the young lady, the same day caused her to be proclaimed Queen of Bussara, over which they reigned in mutual happiness to an advanced age. End of section 7 End of the history of Prince Zain al-Asnan and the Sultan of the Genie Section 8 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3 Translated by Jonathan Scott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Gillian Hendry The Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3 Translated by Jonathan Scott, 1754-1829 to 1829. Section 8 The History of Kudadad and His Brothers Those who have written the history of Deir Bekir inform us that there formerly reigned in the city of Haran a most magnificent and potent sultan, who loved his subjects, and was equally beloved by them. He was endued with all virtues, and wanted nothing to complete his happiness but an heir. Though he had the finest women in the world in his seraglio, yet he was destitute of children. He continually prayed to heaven for them, and one night, in his sleep, a comely person, or rather a prophet, appeared to him, and said, Your prayers are heard. You have obtained what you have desired. Rise as soon as you awake, go to your prayers, and make two genuflections. Then walk into the garden of your palace, call your gardener, and bid him bring you a pomegranate. Eat as many of the seeds as you please, 
and your wishes shall be accomplished. The sultan, calling to mind his dream when he awoke, returned thanks to heaven, got up, prayed, made two genuflections, and then went into his garden, where he took fifty pomegranate seeds, which he counted, and ate. He had fifty wives who shared his bed. They all proved with child. But there was one called Peruzj, who did not appear to be pregnant. He took an aversion to this lady, and would have her put to death. Her barrenness, said he, is a certain token that heaven does not judge Peruzj worthy to bear a prince. It is my duty to deliver the world from an object that is odious to the Lord. He would have executed his cruel purpose had not his vizier prevented him, representing to him that all women were not of the same constitution, and that it was not impossible but that Peruzj might be with child, though it did not yet appear. Well, answered the sultan, let her live, but let her depart my court, for I cannot endure her. Your majesty, replied the vizier, may send her to Sultan Samer, your cousin. The sultan approved of this advice. He sent Peruzj to Samaria, with a letter in which he ordered his cousin to treat her well, and in case she proved with child, to give him notice of her being brought to bed. No sooner was Peruzj arrived in that country than it appeared that she was pregnant, and at length she was delivered of a most beautiful prince. The prince of Samaria wrote immediately to the sultan of Haran to acquaint him with the birth of a son and to congratulate him on the occasion. The sultan was much rejoiced at this intelligence and answered Prince Samar as follows. Cousin, all my other wives have each been delivered of a prince. I desire you to educate that of Peruzj, to give him the name of Kodadad, and to send him to me when I may apply for him. The prince of Samaria spared nothing that might improve the education of his nephew. He taught him to ride, draw the bow, and all other accomplishments becoming the son of a sovereign, so that Kodadad, at eighteen years of age, was looked upon as a prodigy. The young prince, being inspired with a courage worthy of his birth, said one day to his mother, Madam, I begin to grow weary of Samaria. I feel a passion for glory. Give me leave to seek it amidst the perils of war. My father, the Sultan of Haran, has many enemies. Why does he not call me to his assistance? Why does he leave me here so long in obscurity? Must I spend my life in sloth, when all my brothers have the happiness to be fighting by his side? My son, answered Peruzj, I am no less impatient to have your name become famous. I could wish you had already signalized yourself against your father's enemies, but we must wait till he requires it. No, madam, replied Kudadad, I have already waited but too long. I burn to see the sultan, and am tempted to offer him my service as a young stranger. No doubt but he will accept of it, and I will not discover myself till I have performed some glorious actions. I desire to merit his esteem before he knows who I am. Peruzj approved of his generous resolutions, and Kudadad departed from Samaria as if he had been going to the chase, without acquainting Prince Samar, lest he should thwart his design. He was mounted on a white charger, who had a bit and shoes of gold. His housing was of blue satin, embroidered with pearls. The hilt of his scimitar was of one single diamond, and the scabbard of sandalwood, adorned with emeralds and rubies, and on his shoulder he carried his bow and quiver. In this equipage, which greatly set off his handsome person, he arrived at the city of Haran, and soon found means to offer his service to the sultan, who, being charmed with his beauty and promising appearance, and perhaps indeed by natural sympathy, gave him a favourable reception, and asked his name and quality. Sir, answered Kudadad, I am son to an emir of Grand Cairo. An inclination to travel has made me quit my country, and understanding in my passage through your dominions, that you were engaged in war, I am come to your court to offer your majesty my service. The sultan showed him extraordinary kindness, and gave him a command in his army. 
the young prince soon signalized his bravery he gained the esteem of the officers and was admired by the soldiers having no less wit than courage he so far advanced himself in the sultan's esteem as to become his favourite all the ministers and other courtiers daily resorted to Gudadad, and were so eager to purchase his friendship that they neglected the sultan's sons the princes could not but resent this conduct and imputing it to the stranger all conceived an implacable hatred against him but the sultan's affection daily increasing he was never weary of giving him fresh testimonies of his regard he always would have him near his person admired his conversation ever full of wit and discretion and to show his high opinion of his wisdom and prudence committed to his care the other princes though he was of the same age as they so that Kudadad was made governor of his brothers this only served to heighten their hatred is it come to this said they that the sultan not satisfied with loving a stranger more than us will have him to be our governor and not allow us to act without his leave this is not to be endured we must rid ourselves of this foreigner let us go together said one of them and dispatch him no no answered another we had better be cautious how we sacrifice ourselves his death would render us odious to the sultan who in return would declare us all unworthy to reign let us destroy him by some stratagem we will ask his permission to hunt and when at a distance from the palace proceed to some other city and stay there some time the sultan will wonder at our absence and perceiving we do not return perhaps put the stranger to death or at least will banish him from court for suffering us to leave the palace all the princes applauded this artifice they went together to Kadadad and desired him to allow them to take the diversion of hunting promising to return the same day Huruj's son was taken in the snare and granted the permission his brothers desired they set out but never returned they had been three days absent when the sultan asked Kudadad where the princes were for it was long since he had seen them sir answered Kudadad, after making a profound reverence they have been hunting these three days but they promised me they would return sooner the sultan grew uneasy and his uneasiness increased when he perceived the princes did not return the next day he could not check his anger indiscreet stranger said he to Kudadad, why did you let my sons go without bearing them company is it thus you discharge the trust i have reposed in you go seek them immediately and bring them to me or your life shall be forfeited these words chilled with alarm Guruj's unfortunate son he armed himself departed from the city and like a shepherd who had lost his flock searched the country for his brothers inquiring at every village whether they had been seen but hearing no news of them abandoned himself to the most lively grief alas my brothers said he what is become of you are you fallen into the hands of our enemies am i come to the court of haran to be the occasion of giving the sultan so much anxiety he was inconsolable for having given the princes permission to hunt or for not having borne them company after some days spent in fruitless search he came to a plain of prodigious extent in the midst whereof was a palace built of black marble he drew near and at one of the windows beheld a most beautiful lady but set off with no other ornament than her own charms for her hair was dishevelled her garments torn and on her countenance appeared all the marks of the greatest affliction as soon as she saw Kodadad, and judged he might hear her she directed her discourse to him saying young man depart from this fatal place or you will soon fall into the hands of the monster that inhabits it a black who feeds only on human blood resides in this palace he seizes all persons whom their ill fate conducts to this plain and shuts them up in his dark dungeons whence they are never released but to be devoured by him madam answered Kudadad, 
tell me who you are, and be not concerned for myself. I am a young woman of quality of Grand Cairo, replied the lady. I was passing by this castle yesterday, in my way to Baghdad, and met with the black, who killed all my attendants, and brought me hither. I wish I had nothing but death to fear, but to add to my calamity, this monster would persuade me to love him, and in case I do not yield to-morrow to his brutality, I must expect the last violence. Once more, added she, make your escape. The black will soon return. He has gone out to pursue some travellers he espied at a distance on the plain. Lose no time. I know not whether you can escape him by a speedy flight. She had scarcely done speaking before the black appeared. He was of monstrous bulk, and of a dreadful aspect, mounted on a large tartar horse, and bore such a heavy scimitar that none but himself could wield. The prince, seeing him, was amazed at his gigantic stature, directed his prayers to heaven to assist him, then drew his scimitar, and firmly awaited his approach. The monster, despising so inconsiderable an enemy, called to him to submit without fighting. Kudadad, by his conduct, showed that he was resolved to defend his life, for, rushing upon him, he wounded him on the knee. The black, feeling himself wounded, uttered such a dreadful yell as made all the plain resound. He grew furious and foamed with rage, and raising himself on his stirrups, made at Kudadad with his dreadful scimitar. The blow was so violent that it would have put an end to the young prince, had not he avoided it by a sudden spring. The scimitar made a horrible hissing in the air, but before the black could have time to make a second blow, Kudadad struck him on his right arm, with such force that he cut it off. The dreadful scimitar fell with the hand that held it, and the black yielding under the violence of the stroke lost his stirrups, and made the earth shake with the weight of his fall. The prince alighted at the same time, and cut off his enemy's head. Just then, the lady who had been a spectator of the combat, and was still offering up her earnest prayers to heaven for the young hero, whom she admired, uttered a shriek of joy, and said to Kadadad, Prince, for the dangerous victory you have obtained, as well as your noble heir, convinces me that you are of no common rank. Finish the work you have begun. The black has the keys of this castle. Take them, and deliver me out of prison. The prince searched the wretch as he lay stretched on the ground, and found several keys. He opened the first door, and entered a court, where he saw the lady coming to meet him. She would have cast herself at his feet, the better to express her gratitude, but he would not permit her. She commended his valour, and extolled him above all the heroes in the world. He returned her compliments, and she appeared still more lovely to him near than she had done at a distance. I know not whether she felt more joy at being delivered from the desperate danger she had been in, than he for having done so considerable a service to so beautiful a person. Their conversation was interrupted by dismal cries and groans. "'What do I hear?' said Kudadad. "'Whence come these miserable lamentations which pierce my ears?' "'My lord,' said the lady to him, pointing to a little door in the court, "'they come from thence. There are I know not how many wretched persons whom fate has thrown into the hands of the black. They are all chained, and the monster drew out one every day to devour.' "'It is an addition to my joy,' answered the young prince, to understand that my victory will save the lives of those unfortunate beings. Come along with me, madam, to partake in the satisfaction of giving them their liberty. You may judge by your own feelings how welcome we shall be to them. Having so said, they advanced towards the door of the dungeon, and the nearer they drew, the more distinctly they heard the lamentations of the prisoners. Kudadad pitying them, and impatient to put an end to their sufferings, presently put one of the keys into the lock. The noise made all the unfortunate captives, who concluded it was the black coming, 
according to custom, to seize one of them to devour, redoubled their cries and groans. Lamentable voices were heard, which seemed to come from the centre of the earth. In the meantime, the prince had opened the door. He went down a very steep staircase into a large and deep vault, which received some feeble light from a little window, and in which there were above a hundred persons, bound to stakes, and their hands tied. "'Unfortunate travellers," said he to them, "'wretched victims, who only expected the moment of an approaching cruel death, give thanks to heaven, which has this day delivered you by my means. I have slain the black by whom you were to be devoured, and am come to knock off your chains.' The prisoners, hearing these words, gave a shout of mingled joy and surprise. Kudadad and the lady began to unbind them, and as soon as any of them were loose, they helped to take off the fetters from the rest, so that in a short time they were all at liberty. They then kneeled down, and having returned thanks to Kudadad for what he had done for them, went out of the dungeon. But when they were come into the court, how was the prince surprised to see among the prisoners those he was in search of, and almost without hopes to find? Princes, cried he, am I not deceived? Is it you whom I behold? May I flatter myself that it may be in my power to restore you to the sultan your father, who is inconsolable for the loss of you? But will he not have some one to lament? Are you all here alive? Alas, the death of one of you will suffice to damp the joy I feel for having delivered you. The forty-nine princes all made themselves known to Kadadad, who embraced them one after another, and told them how uneasy their father was on account of their absence. They gave their deliverer all the commendations he deserved, as did the other prisoners, who could not find words expressive enough to declare their gratitude. Kudadad, with them, searched the whole castle, where was immense wealth, curious silks, gold brocades, Persian carpets, china satins, and an infinite quantity of other goods, which the black had taken from the caravans he had plundered, a considerable part whereof belonged to the prisoners Kudadad had then liberated. Every man knew and claimed his property. The prince restored them their own, and divided the rest of the merchandise among them. Then he said to them, how will you carry away your goods? We are here in a desert place, and there is no likelihood of your getting horses. My lord, answered one of the prisoners, the black robbed us of our camels as well as our goods, and perhaps they may be in the stables of this castle. That is not unlikely, replied Kadadad. Let us examine. Accordingly, they went to the stables where they not only found the camels, but also the horses belonging to the sultan of Haran's sons. There were some black slaves in the stables, who, seeing all the prisoners released, and guessing thereby that their master had been killed, fled through byways well known to them. Nobody minded to pursue them. All the merchants, overjoyed that they had recovered their goods and camels, together with their liberty, thought of nothing but prosecuting their journey but first repeated their thanks to their deliverer. When they were gone, Kudadad, directing his discourse to the lady, said, What place, madam, do you desire to go to? Whither were you bound when you were seized by the black? I intend to bear you company to the place you shall choose for your retreat, and I question not but that all these princes will do the same. The sultan of Haran's sons protested to the lady, that they would not leave her till she was restored to her friends. Princes, said she, I am of a country too remote from hence, and besides that, it would be abusing your generosity to oblige you to travel so far. I must confess that I have left my native country for ever. I told you that I was a lady of Grand Cairo, but since you have shown me so much favour, and I am so highly obliged to you, added she, looking upon Kadadad, I should be much in the wrong in concealing the truth from you. I am a sultan's daughter. A usurper has possessed himself of my father's throne, after having murdered him, and I have been forced to fly to save my life. 
Kudadad and his brothers requested the princess to tell them her story, assuring her they felt a particular interest in her misfortunes, and were determined to spare nothing that might contribute to render her more happy. After thanking them for their repeated protestations of readiness to serve her, she could not refuse to satisfy their curiosity, and began the recital of her adventures in the following manner. End of section 8 Section 9 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3, translated by Jonathan Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The History of Kudadad and His Brothers, Part 2, Princess of Deryabar, Part 1. There was in a certain island a great city called Deryabar, governed by a potent, magnificent, and virtuous sultan, who had no children, which was the only blessing wanting to make him happy. He continually addressed his prayers to heaven, but heaven only partially granted his requests, for the queen his wife, after a long expectation, brought forth a daughter. I am the unfortunate princess. My father was rather grieved than pleased at my birth, but he submitted to the will of God, and caused me to be educated with all possible care, being resolved, since he had no son, to teach me the art of ruling, that I might supply his place after his death. One day, when he was taking the diversion of hunting, he espied a wild ass, which he chased, lost his company, and was carried away so far by his eagerness as to ride on till night. He then alighted, and sat down at the entrance of a wood, in which the ass had sheltered. No sooner was the day shut in than he discovered among the trees a light, which made him conclude that he was not far from some village. He rejoiced at this, hoping that he might pass the night there, and find some person to send to his followers and acquaint them where he was. Accordingly, he rose and walked towards the light, which served to guide him. He soon found he had been deceived, the light being no other than a fire blazing in a hut. However, he drew near, and with amazement beheld a black man, or rather a giant, sitting on a sofa. Before the monster was a great pitcher of wine, and he was roasting an ox he had newly killed. Sometimes he drank out of the pitcher, and sometimes cut slices off the ox, and greedily devoured them. But what most attracted my father's attention was a beautiful woman whom he saw in the hut. She seemed overwhelmed with grief. Her hands were bound, and at her feet was a little child about two or three years old, who, as if he was sensible of his mother's misfortunes, wept without ceasing, and rent the air with his cries. My father, moved with this pitiable object, thought at first to enter the hut, and attack the giant. But considering how unequal the combat would be, he stopped, and resolved, since he had not strength enough to prevail by open force, to use art. In the meantime, the giant having emptied the pitcher, and devoured above half the ox, turned to the woman, and said, Beautiful princess, why do you oblige me by your obstinacy to treat you with severity? It is in your own power to be happy. You need only resolve to love and be true to me, and I shall treat you with more mildness. Thou hideous satyr, answered the lady, never expect that time should wear away my abhorrence of thee. Thou wilt ever be a monster in my eyes. To these words she added so many reproaches that the giant grew enraged. This is too much cried he in a furious tone. My love despised is turned into rage. Your hatred has at last excited mine. I find it triumphs over my desires, and that I now wish your death more ardently than your enjoyment. Having spoken these words, he took the wretched lady by the hair, held her up with one hand in the air, and drawing his scimitar with the other, was just going to strike off her head, when the sultan my father let fly an arrow which pierced the giant's breast, 
so that he staggered and dropped down dead. My father entered the hut, unbound the lady's hands, inquired who she was, and how she came thither. "'My lord,' said she, "'there are along the sea-coast some families of Saracens who live under a prince who is my husband. This giant you have killed was one of his principal officers. The wretch fell desperately in love with me, but took care to conceal his passion till he could put in execution the design he had formed of forcing me from home. Fortune oftener favours wicked designs than virtuous resolutions. The giant one day surprised me and my child in a by-place. He seized us both, and to disappoint the search he well knew my husband would cause to be made for me, removed from the country inhabited by those Saracens, and brought us into this wood, where he has kept me some days. Deplorable as my condition is, it is still a great satisfaction to me to think that the giant, though so brutal, never used force to obtain what I always refused to his entreaties. Not but that he has a hundred times threatened that he would have recourse to the worst of extremities, in case he could not otherwise prevail upon me. And I must confess to you that a while ago, when I provoked his anger by my words, I was less concerned for my life than for my honour. This, my lord, said the prince of the Saracen's wife, is the faithful account of my misfortunes, and I question not but you will think me worthy of your compassion, and that you will not repent having so generously relieved me. Madam, answered my father, be assured your troubles have affected me, and I will do all in my power to make you happy. Tomorrow, as soon as day appears, we will quit this wood, and endeavour to fall into the road which leads to the great city of Deryabar, of which I am sovereign. And if you think fit, you shall be lodged in my palace, till the prince your husband comes to claim you. The Saracen lady accepted the offer, and the next day followed the sultan my father, who found all his retinue upon the skirts of the wood, they having spent the night in searching for him, and being very uneasy because they could not find him. They were no less rejoiced to meet with than amazed to see him with a lady, whose beauty surprised them. He told them how he had found her, and the risk he had run in approaching the hut, where he must certainly have lost his life had the giant discovered him. One of his servants took up the lady behind him, and another carried the child. Thus they arrived at the palace of my father, who assigned the beautiful Saracen lady an apartment and caused her child to be carefully educated. The lady was not insensible of the sultan's goodness to her, and expressed as much gratitude as he could desire. She had at first appeared very uneasy and impatient that her husband did not claim her. But by degrees she lost that uneasiness. The respect my father paid her dispelled her impatience, and I am of opinion she would at last have blamed fortune more for restoring her to her kindred than she did for removing her from them. In the meantime, the lady's son grew up. He was very handsome, and not wanting ability, found means to please the sultan my father, who conceived a great friendship for him. All the courtiers perceived it, and guessed that the young man might in the end be my husband. In this idea, and looking on him already as heir to the crown, they made their court to him, and every one endeavoured to gain his favour. He soon saw into their designs, grew conceited of himself, and, forgetting the distance there was between our conditions, flattered himself with the hopes that my father was fond enough of him to prefer him before all the princes in the world. He went farther, for the sultan not offering me to him as soon as he could have wished, he had the boldness to ask me of him. Whatever punishment his insolence deserved, my father was satisfied with telling him he had other thoughts in relation to me, and showed him no further resentment. The youth was incensed at this refusal. He resented the contempt, as if he had asked some maid of ordinary extraction, or as if his birth had been equal to mine. 
nor did he stop here, but resolved to be revenged on the sultan, and with unparalleled ingratitude conspired against him. In short, he murdered him, and caused himself to be proclaimed sovereign of Deryabar. The first thing he did after the murder of my father was to come into my apartment at the head of a party of the conspirators. His design was either to take my life or oblige me to marry him. The Grand Vizier, however, who had been always loyal to his master, while the usurper was butchering my father, came to carry me away from the palace, and secured me in a friend's house, till a vessel he had provided was ready to sail. I then left the island, attended only by a governess and that generous minister, who chose rather to follow his master's daughter and share her misfortunes than to submit to a tyrant. The Grand Vizier designed to carry me to the courts of the neighbouring sultans to implore their assistance and excite them to revenge my father's death. But heaven did not concur in a resolution we thought so just. When we had been but a few days at sea, there arose such a furious storm that in spite of all the mariner's art, our vessel, carried away by the violence of the winds and waves, was dashed in pieces against a rock. I will not spend time in describing our shipwreck. I can but faintly represent to you how my governess, the Grand Vizier, and all that attended me were swallowed up by the sea. The dread I was seized with did not permit me to observe all the horror of our condition. I lost my senses, and whether I was thrown upon the coast upon any part of the wreck, or whether heaven, which reserved me for other misfortunes, wrought a miracle for my deliverance, I found myself on shore when my senses returned. Misfortunes very often make us forget our duty. Instead of returning thanks to God for so singular a favour shown me, I only lifted up my eyes to heaven to complain because I had been preserved. I was so far from bewailing the vizier and my governess that I envied their fate, and dreadful imaginations by degrees prevailing over my reason, I resolved to cast myself into the sea. I was on the point of doing so when I heard behind me a great noise of men and horses. I looked about to see what it might be, and espied several armed horsemen, among whom was one mounted on an Arabian horse. He had on a garment embroidered with silver, a girdle set with precious stones, and a crown of gold on his head. Though his habit had not convinced me that he was chief of the company, I should have judged it by the air of grandeur which appeared in his person. He was a young man, extraordinarily well-shaped, and perfectly beautiful. Surprised to see a young lady alone in that place, he sent some of his officers to ask who I was. I answered only by weeping. The shore being covered with the wreck of our ship, they concluded that I was certainly some person who had escaped from the vessel. This conjecture and my inconsolable condition excited the curiosity of the officers who began to ask me a thousand questions with assurances that their master was a generous prince and that i should receive protection at his court the sultan impatient to know who i was grew weary of waiting the return of his officers and drew near to me he gazed on me very earnestly and observing that I did not cease weeping and afflicting myself, without being able to return an answer to their questions, he forbade them troubling me any more, and directing his discourse to me. Madam, said he, I conjure you to moderate your excessive affliction. Though heaven in its dispensations has laid this calamity upon you, it does not behove you to despair. I beseech you show more resolution." Fortune, which has hitherto persecuted you, is inconstant, and may soon change. I dare assure you that, if your misfortunes are capable of receiving any relief, you shall find it in my dominions. My palace is at your service. You shall live with the queen, my mother, who will endeavour by her kindness to ease your affliction. I know not yet who you are, but I find I already take an interest in your welfare." 
I thanked the young sultan for his goodness to me, accepted his obliging offers, and to convince him that I was not unworthy of them, told him my condition. I described to him the insolence of the young Saracen, and found it was enough to recount my misfortunes, to excite compassion in him and all his officers who heard me. When I had done speaking, the prince began again, assuring me that he was deeply concerned at my misfortunes. He then conducted me to his palace, and presented me to the queen his mother, to whom I was obliged again to repeat my misfortunes, and to renew my tears. The queen seemed very sensible of my trouble, and conceived extreme affection for me. On the other hand, the sultan her son fell desperately in love with me, and soon offered me his person and his crown. I was so taken up with the thoughts of my calamities, that the prince, though so lovely a person, did not make so great an impression on me as he might have done at another time. However, gratitude prevailing, I did not refuse to make him happy, and our nuptials were concluded with all imaginable splendour. While the people were taken up with the celebration of their sovereign's nuptials, a neighbouring prince, his enemy, made a descent by night on the island with a great number of troops. That formidable enemy was the king of Zangubar. He surprised and cut to pieces my husband's subjects. He was very near taking us both. We escaped very narrowly, for he had already entered the palace with some of his followers, but we found means to slip away and to get to the sea coast, where we threw ourselves into a fishing boat which we had the good fortune to meet with. Two days we were driven about by the winds, without knowing what would become of us. The third day we espied a vessel making towards us under sail. We rejoiced at first, believing it had been a merchant ship which might take us aboard. But what was our consternation when, as it drew near, we saw ten or twelve armed pirates appear on the deck. Having boarded, five or six of them leaped into our boat, seized us, bound the prince, and conveyed us into their ship, where they immediately took off my veil. My youth and features touched them, and they all declared how much they were charmed at the sight of me. Instead of casting lots, each of them claimed the preference, and me as his right. The dispute grew warm. They came to blows and fought like madmen. The deck was soon covered with dead bodies, and they were all killed but one, who, being left sole possessor of me, said, You are mine. I will carry you to Grand Cairo, to deliver you to a friend of mine, to whom I have promised a beautiful slave. But who, added he, looking upon the sultan my husband, is that man? What relation does he bear to you? Are you allied by blood or love? Sir, answered I, he is my husband. If so, replied the pirate, in pity I must rid myself of him. It would be too great an affliction to him to see you in my friend's arms. Having spoken these words, he took up the unhappy prince who was bound, and threw him into the sea, notwithstanding all my endeavours to prevent him. I shrieked in a dreadful manner at the sight of what he had done, and had certainly cast myself headlong into the sea, but that the pirate held me. He saw my design, and therefore bound me with cords to the mainmast then hoisting sail, made towards the land, and got ashore. He unbound me, and led me to a little town, where he bought camels, tents, and slaves, and then set out for Grand Cairo, designing, as he still said, to present me to his friend, according to his promise. We had been several days upon the road, when, as we were crossing this plain yesterday, we descried the black who inhabited this castle. At a distance we took him for a tower, and when near us could scarcely believe him to be a man. He drew his huge scimitar, and summoned the pirate to yield himself prisoner with all his slaves and the lady he was conducting. The pirate was daring, and being seconded by his slaves, who promised to stand by him, he attacked the black. The combat lasted a considerable time, but at length the pirate fell under his enemy's deadly blows, as did all his slaves, who chose rather to die than forsake him. 
The black then conducted me to the castle, whither he also brought the pirate's body, which he devoured that night. After his inhuman repast, perceiving that I ceased not weeping, he said to me, Young lady, prepare to love me, rather than continue thus to afflict yourself. Make a virtue of necessity and comply. I will give you till tomorrow to consider. Let me then find you comforted for all your misfortunes, and overjoyed at having been reserved for me. Having spoken these words, he conducted me to a chamber, and withdrew to his own, after locking up the castle gates. He opened them this morning, and presently locked them after him again, to pursue some travellers he perceived at a distance. But it is likely they made their escape, since he was returning alone and without any booty when you attacked him. As soon as the princess had finished the recital of her adventures, Kudadad declared to her that he was deeply concerned at her misfortunes. "'But, madam,' added he, "'it shall be your own fault if you do not live at ease for the future. The sultan of Haran's sons offer you a safe retreat in the court of their father. Be pleased to accept of it. You will be there cherished by that sovereign and respected by all.' and if you do not disdain the affection of your deliverer, permit me to assure you of it, and to espouse you before all these princes. Let them be witnesses to our contract. The princess consented, and the marriage was concluded that very day in the castle, where they found all sorts of provisions. The kitchens were full of flesh and other eatables the black used to feed on, when he was weary of feeding on human bodies. There was also a variety of fruits, excellent in their kinds, and to complete their pleasure, abundance of delicious wine and other liquors. They all sat down at table, and after having eaten and drunk plentifully, took with them the rest of the provisions, and set out for the Sultan of Haran's court. They travelled several days, encamping in the pleasantest places they could find, and were within one day's journey of Haran, when, having halted and drunk all their wine, being under no longer concern to make it hold out, Kudadad, directing his discourse to all the company, said, Princes, I have too long concealed from you who I am. Behold, your brother Kudadad. I have received my being, as well as you, from the Sultan of Haran. The Prince of Samaria brought me up, and the Princess Peruzj is my mother. Madam, added he, addressing himself to the princess of Deryabar, Do you also forgive me for having concealed my birth from you? Perhaps, by discovering it sooner, I might have prevented some disagreeable reflections, which may have been occasioned by a match you may have thought unequal. No, sir, answered the princess. The opinion I at first conceived of you heightened every moment and you did not stand in need of the extraction you now discover to make me happy. The princes congratulated Kudadad on his birth, and expressed much satisfaction at being made acquainted with it. But in reality, instead of rejoicing, their hatred of so amiable a brother was increased. They met together at night, whilst Kudadad and the princess his wife lay asleep in their tent. Those ungrateful, those envious brothers, forgetting that, had it not been for the brave son of Peruzj, they must have been devoured by the black, agreed among themselves to murder him. "'We have no other course to choose,' said one of them. "'For the moment our father shall come to understand that this stranger, of whom he is already so fond, is our brother, and that he alone has been able to destroy a giant,' whom we could not all of us together conquer, he will declare him his heir, to the prejudice of all his brothers, who will be obliged to obey and fall down before him. He added much more, which made such an impression on their envious and unnatural minds, that they immediately repaired to Gadadad, then asleep, stabbed him repeatedly, and leaving him for dead in the arms of the princess of Deryabar, proceeded on their journey for the city of Haran, where they arrived the next day. The sultan, their father, conceived the greater joy at their return, because he had despaired of ever seeing them again. He asked what had been the occasion of their stay. 
but they took care not to acquaint him with it, making no mention either of the black or of Kodadad, and only saying that, being curious to see different countries, they had spent some time in the neighbouring cities. In the meantime, Kodadad lay in his tent, weltering in his blood, and little differing from a dead man, with the princess his wife, who seemed to be in not much better condition than himself. She rent the air with her dismal shrieks, tore her hair, and bathing her husband's body with her tears, Alas, Kodadad, my dear Kodadad, cried she, is it you whom I behold just departing this life? What cruel hands have put you into this condition? Can I believe these are your brothers, who have treated you so unmercifully, those brothers whom thy valour had saved? No, they are rather devils, who under characters so dear came to murder you. O oh, barbarous wretches, how could you make so ungrateful a return for the service he has done you? But why should I complain of your brother's unfortunate Kodadad? I alone am to blame for your death. You would join your fate with mine, and all the ill fortune that has attended me since I left my father's palace has fallen upon you. O oh, heaven, which has condemned me to lead a life of calamities, if you will not permit me to have a consort, why did you permit me to find one? Behold, you have now robbed me of two, just as I began to be attached to them. By these and other moving expressions, the afflicted princess of Deryabar vented her sorrow, fixing her eyes on the unfortunate Kodadad, who could not hear her. But he was not dead, and his consort, observing that he still breathed, ran to a large town she espied in the plain to inquire for a surgeon. She was directed to one, who went immediately with her. But when they came to the tent, they could not find Kodadad, which made them conclude he had been dragged away by some wild beast to be devoured. The princess renewed her complaints and lamentations in a most affecting manner. The surgeon was moved, and being unwilling to leave her in so distressed a condition, proposed to her to return to the town, offering her his house and service. She suffered herself to be prevailed on. The surgeon conducted her to his house, and without knowing as yet who she was, treated her with all imaginable courtesy and respect. He used all his endeavours to comfort her, but it was vain to think of removing her sorrow which was rather heightened than diminished. Madam, said he to her one day, be pleased to recount to me your misfortunes. Tell me your country and your condition. Perhaps I may give you some good advice, when I am acquainted with all the circumstances of your calamity. You do nothing but afflict yourself, without considering that remedies may be found for the most desperate diseases. The surgeon's words were so efficacious that they wrought on the princess, who recounted to him all her adventures. And when she had done, the surgeon directed his discourse to her. Madam, said he, you ought not thus to give way to your sorrow. You ought rather to arm yourself with resolution, and perform what the name and the duty of a wife require of you. You are bound to avenge your husband. If you please, I will wait on you as your attendant. Let us go to the Sultan of Haran's court. He is a good and a just prince. You need only represent to him in lively colours how Prince Kudadad has been treated by his brothers. I am persuaded he will do you justice. I submit to your reasons, answered the princess. It is my duty to endeavour to avenge Kudadad, and since you are so generous as to offer to attend me, I am ready to set out. No sooner had she fixed this resolution than the surgeon ordered two camels to be made ready, on which the princess and he mounted, and repaired to Haran. End of section 9。section 10 of the Arabian Nights Entertainment, volume 3, translated by Jonathan Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The History of Kodadad and His Brothers, Part 3. 
the history of the princess of deryaber part two they alighted at the first caravanserai they found and inquired of the host the news at court it is said he in very great perplexity the sultan had a son who lived long with him as a stranger and none can tell what is become of the young prince one of the sultan's wives named peruvsch is his mother she has made all possible inquiry but to no purpose all are concerned at the loss of this prince because he had great merit the sultan has forty-nine other sons all by different mothers but not one of them has virtue enough to comfort him for the death of Kodadad. I say his death because it is impossible he should be still alive, since no intelligence has been heard of him, notwithstanding so much search has been made. The surgeon, having heard this account from the host, concluded that the best course the princess of Deryabar could take was to wait upon Peruvsch, but that step was not without some danger and required much precaution for it was to be feared that if the sultan of haran's sons should happen to hear of the arrival of their sister-in-law and her design they might cause her to be conveyed away before she could discover herself to kadadad's mother the surgeon weighed all these circumstances considered what risk he might run himself and therefore that he might manage matters with discretion desired the princess to remain in the caravanserai whilst he repaired to the palace to observe which might be the safest way to conduct her to Peruzsch. he went accordingly into the city and was walking towards the palace like one led only by curiosity to see the court when he beheld a lady mounted on a mule richly accoutred she was followed by several ladies mounted also on mules with a great number of guards and black slaves all the people formed a lane to see her pass along and saluted her by prostrating themselves on the ground the surgeon paid her the same respect and then asked a calendar who happened to stand by him whether that lady was one of the sultan's wives yes brother answered the calendar she is and the most honoured and beloved by the people because she is the mother of prince kodadad of whom you must have heard the surgeon asked no more questions but followed perused to a mosque into which she went to distribute alms and assist at the public prayers which the sultan had ordered to be offered up for the safe return of kodadad the people who were highly concerned for that young prince ran in crowds to join their vows to the prayers of the priests so that the mosque was quite full the surgeon broke through the throng and advanced to Peruzsch guards. He waited the conclusion of the prayers, and when the princess went out, stepped up to one of her slaves and whispered him in the ear, Brother, I have a secret of moment to impart to the princess Peruzsch. May not I by your means be introduced into her apartment? If that secret, answered the slave, relate to Prince Kodadad, I dare promise you shall have audience of her this very day. But if it concern not him, it is needless for you to endeavour to be introduced, for her thoughts are all engrossed by her son, and she will not hear of any other subject. It is only about that dear son, replied the surgeon, that I wish to speak to her. If so, said the slave, you need only follow us to the palace, and you shall soon have the opportunity accordingly as soon as peruzsch was returned to her apartment the slave acquainted her that a person unknown had some important information to communicate to her and that it related to prince kadadad no sooner had he uttered these words than peruzsch expressed her impatience to see the stranger the slave immediately conducted him into the princess's closet who ordered all her women to withdraw except two from whom she concealed nothing as soon as she saw the surgeon, she asked him eagerly what news he had to tell her of Kodadad. Madam, answered the surgeon, after having prostrated himself on the ground, I have a long account to give you, and such as will surprise you. He then related all the particulars of what had passed between Kodadad and his brothers, which she listened to with eager attention. 
but when he came to speak of the murder, the tender mother fainted away on her sofa, as if she had herself been stabbed like her son. Her two women used proper means, and soon brought her to herself. The surgeon continued his relation, and when he had concluded, Peruvj said to him, "'Go back to the princess of Duryabar, and assure her from me that the sultan shall soon own her for his daughter-in-law, and as for yourself, be satisfied that your services shall be rewarded as liberally as they deserve.' When the surgeon was gone, Peruvj remained on the sofa in such a state of affliction as may easily be imagined and yielding to her tenderness at the recollection of Kudadad, "'Oh, my son,' said she, "'I must never then expect to see you more. Alas, when I gave you leave to depart from Samaria, and you took leave of me, I did not imagine that so unfortunate a death awaited you at such a distance from me. Unfortunate Kudadad, why did you leave me?' You would not, it is true, have acquired so much renown, but you had been still alive, and not have cost your mother so many tears. While she uttered these words, she wept bitterly, and her two attendants, moved by her grief, mingled their tears with hers. Whilst they were all three in this manner vying in affliction, the sultan came into the closet, and seeing them in this condition, asked Peruvj whether she had received any bad news concerning Kudadad. "'Alas, sir,' said she, "'all is over. My son has lost his life, and to add to my sorrow, I cannot pay him the funeral rites, for in all probability wild beasts have devoured him.' She then told him all she had heard from the surgeon, and did not fail to enlarge on the inhuman manner in which Kudadad had been murdered by his brothers. The sultan did not give Peruvj time to finish her relation, but transported with anger and giving way to his passion, Madam, said he to the princess, those perfidious wretches who cause you to shed these tears and are the occasion of mortal grief to their father shall soon feel the punishment due to their guilt. The sultan, having spoken these words, with indignation in his countenance, went directly to the presence chamber where all his courtiers attended, and such of the people as had petitions to present to him. They were alarmed to see him in passion, and thought his anger had been kindled against his people. Their hearts were chilled with fear. He ascended the throne, and, causing his grand vizier to approach, Hassan, said he, go immediately. Take a thousand of my guards, and seize all the princes, my sons. Shut them up in the tower used as a prison for murderers, and let this be done in a moment. All who were present trembled at this extraordinary command, and the Grand Vizier, without uttering a word, laid his hand on his head to express his obedience, and hastened from the hall to execute his orders. In the meantime, the sultan dismissed those who attended for audience, and declared he would not hear of any business for a month to come. He was still in the hall when the vizier returned. "'Are all my sons,' demanded he, "'in the tower?' "'They are, sir,' answered the vizier. "'I have obeyed your orders.' "'This is not all,' replied the sultan. "'I have further commands for you.' And so saying, he went out of the hall of audience, and returned to Peruzj apartments, the vizier following him. He asked the princess where Kadadad's widow had taken up her lodging. Peruzj's women told him, for the surgeon had not forgotten that in his relation. The sultan then, turning to his minister, Go, said he, to this caravanserai, and conduct a young princess who lodges there, with all the respect due to her quality, to my palace. The vizier was not long in performing what he was ordered. He mounted on horseback with all the emirs and courtiers, and repaired to the caravanserai, where the princess of Duryaba was lodged, whom he acquainted with his orders, and presented her from the sultan a fine white mule, whose saddle and bridle were adorned with gold, rubies, and diamonds. She mounted and proceeded to the palace. The surgeon attended her, 
mounted on a beautiful tartar horse, which the vizier had provided for him. All the people were at their windows or in the streets to see the cavalcade, and it being given out that the princess, whom they conducted in such state to court, was Kadadad's wife, the city resounded with acclamations. The air rung with shouts of joy, which would have been turned into lamentations had that prince's fatal adventure been known, so much was he beloved by all. The princess of Deryabar found the sultan at the palace gate, waiting to receive her. He took her by the hand and led her to Peru's apartment, where a very moving scene took place. Kodadad's wife found her affliction redouble at the sight of her husband's father and mother, as, on the other hand, those parents could not look on their son's wife without being much affected. She cast herself at the sultan's feet, and having bathed them with tears, was so overcome with grief that she was not able to speak. Perust was in no better state, and the sultan, moved by these affecting objects, gave way to his own feelings and wept. All three, mingling their tears and sighs, had for some time observed a silence, equally tender and pitiful. At length the princess of Deryabar, being somewhat recovered, recounted the adventure of the castle and Kodadad's disaster. Then she demanded justice for the treachery of the princes. "'Yes, madam,' said the sultan, "'those ungrateful wretches shall perish. But Kodadad's death must be first made public, that the punishment of his brothers may not cause my subjects to rebel. And though we have not my son's body, we will not omit paying him the last duties.' This said, he directed his discourse to the vizier, and ordered him to cause to be erected a dome of white marble in a delightful plain, in the midst of which the city of Haran stands. Then he appointed the princess of Deryabar a suitable apartment in his palace, acknowledging her for his daughter-in-law. Hassan caused the work to be carried on with such diligence, and employed so many workmen, that the dome was soon finished. Within it was erected a tomb, which was covered with gold brocade. When all was completed, the sultan ordered prayers to be said, and appointed a day for the obsequies of his son. On that day, all the inhabitants of the city went out upon the plain to see the ceremony performed, which was after the following manner. The sultan, attended by his vizier and the principal lords of the court, proceeded towards the dome, and being come to it, he went in and sat down with them on carpets of black satin embroidered with gold flowers. A great body of horse guards hanging their heads drew up close about the dome and marched round it twice, observing a profound silence. But at the third round they halted before the door and all of them with a loud voice pronounced these words, O Prince, son to the Sultan, could we by dint of sword and human valour repair your misfortune, we would bring you back to life. But the king of kings has commanded, and the angel of death has obeyed. Having uttered these words, they drew off, to make way for a hundred old men, all of them mounted on black mules and having long grey beards. These were anchorites, who had lived all their days concealed in caves. They never appeared in sight of the world, but when they were to assist at the obsequies of the sultans of Haran, and of the princes of their family. Each of these venerable persons carried on his head a book, which he held with one hand. They took three turns round the dome, without uttering a word. Then, stopping before the door, one of them said, O oh, prince, what can we do for thee? If thou couldst be restored to life by prayer or learning, we would rub our grey beards at thy feet and recite prayers. But the king of the universe has taken thee away for ever. This said, the old men moved to a distance from the dome, and immediately fifty beautiful young maidens drew near to it, each of them mounted on a little white horse. They wore no veils, and carried gold baskets full of all sorts of precious stones. They also rode thrice round the dome, and halting at the same place as the others had done, the youngest of them spoke in the name of all as follows. 
Oh, prince, one so beautiful, what relief can you expect from us? If we could restore you to life by our charms, we would become your slaves. But you are no longer sensible to beauty, and have no more occasion for us. When the young maids were withdrawn, the sultan and his courtiers arose, and having walked thrice around the tomb, the sultan spoke as follows. O oh, my dear son, light of my eyes, I have then lost thee for ever. He accompanied these words with sighs, and watered the tomb with his tears, his courtiers weeping with him. The gate of the dome was then closed, and all the people returned to the city. Next day there were public prayers in all the mosques, and the same was continued for eight days successively. On the ninth, the king resolved to cause the princes his sons to be beheaded. The people, incensed at their cruelty towards Kudadad, impatiently expected to see them executed. The scaffolds were erected, but the execution was respited, because on a sudden intelligence was brought that the neighbouring princes, who had before made war on the Sultan of Haran, were advancing with more numerous forces than on the first invasion and were then not far from the city. It had been long known that they were preparing for war, but their preparations caused no alarm. This news occasioned general consternation, and gave new cause to lament the loss of Kodadad, who had signalized himself in the former war against the same enemies. Alas, said they, were the brave Kodadad alive, we should little regard those princes who are coming to surprise us. The sultan, nothing dismayed, raised men with all possible speed, formed a considerable army, and, being too brave to await the enemy's coming to attack him within his walls, marched out to meet them. They, on their side, being informed by their advanced parties that the sultan of Haran was marching to engage them, halted in the plain and formed their army. As soon as the sultan discovered them, he also drew up his forces, and ranged them in order of battle. The signal was given, and he attacked them with extraordinary vigour. Nor was the opposition inferior. Much blood was shed on both sides, and the victory remained long dubious. But at length it seemed to incline to the Sultan of Haran's enemies, who, being more numerous, were upon the point of surrounding him when a great body of cavalry appeared on the plain and approached the two armies. The sight of this fresh party daunted both sides, neither knowing what to think of them. But their doubts were soon cleared, for they fell upon the flank of the Sultan of Haran's enemies with such a furious charge that they soon broke and routed them. Nor did they stop here. They pursued them and cut most of them in pieces. The Sultan of Haran, who had attentively observed all that passed, admired the bravery of this strange body of cavalry whose unexpected arrival had given the victory to his army. But above all, he was charmed with their chief, whom he had seen fighting with a more than ordinary valour. He longed to know the name of the generous hero. Impatient to see and thank him, he advanced towards him, but perceived he was coming to prevent him. The two princes drew near, and the Sultan of Haran, discovering Kodadad in the brave warrior who had just assisted him, or rather defeated his enemies, became motionless with joy and surprise. Father, said Kadadad to him, you have sufficient cause to be astonished at the sudden appearance before your majesty of a man whom perhaps you concluded to be dead. I should have been so had not heaven preserved me still to serve you against your enemies. Oh, my son, cried the sultan, is it possible that you are restored to me? Alas, I despaired of seeing you more. So saying, he stretched out his arms to the young prince, who flew to such a tender embrace. I know all, my son, said the sultan again, after having long held him in his arms. I know what return your brothers have made you for delivering them out of the hands of the black. But you shall be revenged to-morrow. Let us now go to the palace, where your mother, who has shed so many tears on your account, expects me, 
to rejoice with us for the defeat of our enemies. What a joy will it be to her to be informed that my victory is your work! Sir, said Kedadad, give me leave to ask how you could know the adventure of the castle. Have any of my brothers, repenting, owned it to you? No, answered the sultan. The princess of Duryabar has given us an account of everything, for she is in my palace, and came thither to demand justice against your brothers. Kudadad was transported with joy to learn that the princess his wife was at the court. Let us go, sir, cried he to his father in rapture. Let us go to my mother who waits for us. I am impatient to dry up her tears as well as those of the princess of Duryabar. The sultan immediately returned to the city with his army, and re-entered his palace victorious, amidst the acclamations of the people, who followed him in crowds, praying to heaven to prolong his life, and extolling Kadadad to the skies. They found Peruzj and her daughter-in-law waiting to congratulate the sultan, but words cannot express the transports of joy they felt when they saw the young prince with them. Their embraces were mingled with tears of a very different kind from those they had before shed for him. When they had sufficiently yielded to all the emotions that the ties of blood and love inspired, they asked Kodadad by what miracle he came to be still alive. He answered that a peasant mounted on a mule, happening accidentally to come into the tent where he lay senseless, and perceiving him alone, and stabbed in several places, had made him fast on his mule, and carried him to the house, where he applied to his wounds certain herbs, chewed, which recovered him. When I found myself well, added he, I returned thanks to the peasant, and gave him all the diamonds I had. I then made for the city of Haran, but being informed by the way that some neighbouring princes had gathered forces, and were on their march against the sultan's subjects, I made myself known to the villagers, and stirred them up to undertake his defence. I armed a great number of young men, and heading them, happened to arrive at the time when the two armies were engaged. When he had done speaking, the sultan said, Let us return thanks to God for having preserved Kodadad. But it is requisite that the traitors who would have destroyed him should perish. Sir, answered the generous prince, Though they are wicked and ungrateful, consider they are your own flesh and blood. They are my brothers. I forgive their offence, and beg you to pardon them. This generosity drew tears from the sultan, who caused the people to be assembled, and declared Kodadad his heir. He then ordered the princes, who were prisoners, to be brought out loaded with irons. Perused's son struck off their chains, and embraced them all successively, with as much sincerity and affection as he had done in the court of the Black's castle. The people were charmed with Kadadad's generosity, and loaded him with applause. The surgeon was next nobly rewarded in requital of the services he had done the princess of Duryabar. End of section 10 End of the history of Kadadad and his brothers.